Welcome back to Sundial on WLRN. I'm Luis Hernandez. 19 years since the September 11th terror attacks. Tens of thousands of survivors and first responders continue to struggle with health issues. Richard Iodici is among them. He's been retired in Boynton Beach now for close to a decade, but spent 38 years with Con Edison in New York. The Brooklyn native was on site the night of September 11th and spent five months with a team responsible for restoring power to lower Manhattan. I talk about it with my friends and colleagues afterwards. Sometimes we didn't realize it then when we were working what we were doing. You know, we, we had a job, we did what we had to do, and uh, that was it. Now, Yodichi is dealing with sleep apnea, stomach issues, and last year he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. The coronavirus pandemic has made life even more difficult. He's considered part of the high-risk population. He shared his story with us yesterday. And by the way, we should note for parents that may be listening with children, the interview deals with some difficult subject matter. Where were you on September 11th when, when you were called into work? What was going on? September 11th, I finished uh, my night shift. I was on the 11th to 7, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. I got home a little, maybe a little before 8 o'clock in the morning. Tried to get some sleep, tossing and turning. But uh, turned the TV on in the bedroom. And that's when I actually saw the second uh, plane hit the towers. And I really didn't know what was going on. I thought maybe it was a mishap, you know, a, a miscalculation on a pilot. And then when two and two together, you heard the reporters talking and, you know, you figured I just couldn't believe it. So my sleep went out the door. I, w- I, w- I was up until they called us a couple hours later to come in earlier than 11 o'clock at night that night. We went in at 7 and my, my shift started there. And when, when they called you in, what did they tell you about what you were going to be doing? Uh, they didn't. They just asked us to report in early, uh, 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 come in at 7 p.m. instead of 11 p.m. And when we got to the job, uh, to the yard, uh, driving to the yard from, I lived in Long Beach at the time, and a yard was in Brooklyn. You can actually see the smoke in the air. And when I pulled into the yard, it was like, uh, it was like out the back door, you know? It was like it was right there. Uh, my crew, my crew, there was, uh, there was about 10 of us. And they held some of us because the crews earlier were still down there. And um, they held us in the yard that night. And the following day, they sent us down into the city. You went downtown because all the power down in, in lower Manhattan was out. That's where they sent you? Correct. Everything was out. Uh, in one of the towers, we had a substation in the bottom, and that was all collapsed. So, uh, yeah, we went down the next night. Everything was, the bridges and the tunnels were still closed. So um, they escorted us through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, and they, we were there. We, we got about a half, we were about a half a block from the, from the pile, but uh, and, um, it was still, still smoldering. Yeah, what was it like, you know, while you were working, and, and here you are, you're, you're, you know, you're working in the city, you know well, you know inside out, and everything looks just different in that area it wasn't the city that i remembered but uh it was scary i mean uh every time they the uh fire department or the police or the ems found the body in the rubble all the workers stopped we all stopped they ca- they they put it on a, a vehicle and they took it away and then we resumed work there was a couple of buildings that were across the street that they were worried about because of the height, and they didn't know how structural sound they were. So they ran lasers up along the side of the building to see if the building would sway at all. And a couple of times the siren did go off. They got a sway out of the building for whatever reason, and uh, we had to stop working and clear the area. Did they give you protective gear? Like, because you said it was like there was still smoke in the air and all that debris and everything. We had our own uh, full face. Uh, respirator and we had a half face respirator it switched every night or sometimes during the same shift we were down there for 12 14 hour shifts and um it was either half face full face there was kind of a little the company was getting mixed uh signals from whoever was giving the orders to uh the health department whatever which mask to wear but 
as you know, it's, it's not easy to wear a mask for 8 to 10, 12 hours. So you got to take it off sometime. You got to take it off to eat. You got to take it off to drink. And um, that's the way we worked. I mean, we had those light blue, uh, you know, those surgical uh, suits. Uh, it wasn't a regular Tyvek, the thick ones. But uh, we, we took those or we changed those a few times a night. And um, we worked. And when our shift was over, they had a section that they deconned the, the, our trucks before we went back to the yard. Took off all our clothes. We threw them in a separate bin there, and we went back. I mean, some yeah. of some of us took showers in the yard when we went home, before we went home. Some of us just changed our clothes and just wanted to go home, you know, and get out of the yard. From what I remember reading, you know, I don't think people really understood like the danger of being in that and how toxic it was. Right? Nobody talked about that. Right? We, I'm not going to say we were ignorant. Because we weren't. We knew what we were doing. Um, and we just did what we had to do. But nobody, the time, and even a while after, nobody really talked about the toxic stuff. I mean, we saw it. It was all over. It was over our trucks. It was all on the ground. It was on the sides of some buildings. I mean, they were trying to clean and do what they could do. But we didn't think about, you know, we didn't think about what it was and everything but yeah everybody uh everybody got a good whiff of that i'm sure and you were doing that for five months right i mean for for a long time working in that for hours you said 10 12 hours uh, i mean was it just part of the contract with con edison or were you given the option well i the first stint down there when it happened i was down there for two to three weeks then they sent us back and some crews from manhattan were taking care of some of the work there. Then they asked for volunteers to do a four to five month stint down there. Why'd you want to volunteer? Why, why was it, why was it important for you to be part of the team? I, I just wanted to do my part. You know, uh, a lot of the guys in my group volunteered. We did the night shift from 7 PM to 7 AM. So moving forward, Richard, in your life, I wondered when did you start to notice, uh, a change in your health? It wasn't until just before I retired, which was 2012, I started getting a lot of acid reflux, and I think they call it girth. And I really didn't get treated. I mean, I went to the doctors for my, you know, my checkups, and and the company had our our yearly physical too, 911 physical they used to call it. Um, they either used to send us down to Manhattan, 14th Street, our main building, or send a trailer over to our yard. And, do their uh, rig and dig physical. <laughs> I was just doing tums. I was just taking tums until after I got to Florida, and then uh, I, I went on prescription medication later on, 2012. So at the at the beginning, what did you think it was? It was just. Did you think it was just stomach issues? I mean, I thought it was stomach issues. Uh, they checked my. You know, I went for te everything was all right. But you know, when you when you're working out in the field, there's uh, also not too many places to eat. So, you know, that and other things. And then other guys started with it, too, believe it or not. And, you know, we really didn't think much of it. What were the health benefits that they gave you through the uh, World Trade Center health program? I, I didn't have any health benefits until uh, I came down with uh, prostate cancer. I was diagnosed uh, uh, last April. And are they, provi are they providing anything for that? Well, I just now got certified from the World Health trade center i'm going through steps now so uh anything related to my prostate cancer is payable to the uh, world trade center compensation board how are you feeling right now thank god i'm good uh i went through uh, nine weeks of uh, radiation everything was good i finished uh, last august and i go back every three months i get a shot every three months a new prawn shot and i get uh checked by my urologist and supposedly he says that's going to be for another couple of years for the shot. We'll see what happens. And any of the other people that you talk to, are they also facing, you know, similar types of challenges? Oh, yeah. Breathing problems. Uh, some people retired. Even a few of my friends that I worked with had passed away, either from uh, lung cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer. And, uh, yeah, we all have something. I'm speaking with Richard Yodici. 
He worked for Con Edison in New York, helping restore power to lower Manhattan in the aftermath of the September 11th terrorist attacks. Udici is now retired in Boynton Beach, dealing with health complications, and COVID-19 has made things more difficult. I wanted to know, Richard, for you, when the pandemic started and then the state went into lockdown, what were, what was going through your mind at the time? Didn't know. Didn't, didn't know really what it was. Uh, I've been in the house. I don't go food shopping. I mean, I, I, I see a, a cluster of people, like, believe it or not, just a couple of weeks ago, I just... Down the road, I have two of my cousins. Uh, they live with each other, and I just started seeing them. And uh, I don't go food shopping. I have everything delivered. And maybe one or two of my close friends that come over from Palm Beach, uh, you know, we'll, we don't go out to eat. We'll all just, you know, food in. But that's about it. I, I canceled my trip to New York. I was supposed to go for my granddaughter's communion in May. I usually go to New York for four to six weeks, and I had to cancel that, so she received her communion. My immune system, they say, is not the same, and uh, I do take blood pressure medication. And uh, I guess I, I'm going to be kind on myself and say I'm a few pounds overweight. I'm a big guy. So uh, my cousins are coming from New York next month, and... Luckily, they're coming down for six, seven weeks. So I says, well, I won't be seeing you for, for 14 days. And uh, they, un- they understand. They understand. And you said you still have some friends from New York who also, they retired down here. You, you're still in touch with them. Oh, yeah. 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 I got uh, uh, one or two over here in Boynton. I got one in uh, West Palm, World Palm. And a friend of mine... Um, that has a place in Delray. He still lives in Brooklyn full time, though. But they're all retired. And how's everybody doing? How are they all hanging in there? They're doing okay, thank God. Uh, my younger daughter from North Carolina was supposed to come down this month, but I thought about it for a while, and last week I I told her I didn't think it was a good idea right now. How are you guys deciding on that? What What do you think? How long do you think it's going to be before you can either get up there or they can come down here? I. I don't know. So many things were canceled this year. Like I said, my granddaughter's communion, a wedding I was supposed to go to with one of my friends that come down here. I don't know. They didn't even reschedule the wedding. And believe it or not, two of my daughters, I hope it's soon because two of my daughters are getting married next year, the two that live in North Carolina. Do you feel at least a little better knowing, like, because, you know, you're in Palm Beach County and they're starting to reopen. So, it you know, the, the, the rate of COVID has been going down a lot in Palm Beach County. Things look, look a lot better. Thank God. But we also have the flu season coming. So I, I don't try and listen to the news anymore because, to be honest with you, I really don't know who to believe. I'm, I usually lean towards the, the health positions, you know, the doctors, you know, uh, instead of government officials and stuff. Because, uh, But as far as sitting in a restaurant, if... Like I said, I did go to one time to outdoor seating, and but I don't know if I, I don't know if I could sit in a restaurant yet. What is the message that you have for our listeners, for the survivors of nine eleven that are living down here? The people that were down there, they know what it's all about. They know you know what they did and 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 things, and and the people that weren't down there knew everything that that went on that that people did. I mean. Um, as far as the, the COVID, uh, hey, everybody's got to do the right thing. That's that's the problem. If everybody does the right thing, I think we can get through this. You know, uh, just have consideration, and you know, for, for, for yourself, if not for yourself, for other people that are around you. You know, and um, that's it. We'll take it one day at a time. They come out with a vaccine. I don't know if I'm going to run down to CVS and get it right away. I might wait a little bit. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that's about it. I think about how the world changed dramatically after 9-11 in a lot of ways. And we still experience it today, like those changes, like when we travel. Do you see the world changing, like really changing because of this pandemic? Uh, yes, 
I do. Some I've asked myself and a few close members of my family, why why do you think this is happening? I don't know. You know, at 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 I didn't understand it. I don't think maybe I have a total grip on it yet, why it was done. And then I thought maybe maybe God is doing this to us. Maybe he didn't like the what he was seeing. Maybe he was maybe he's trying to get us on a different path. That that's the only that's the only thing. Thing things weren't going right. Things weren't going right. People people didn't have respect for one another. And they still don't a lot. Of, you know, and, and, and that's the whole thing. And you know, people talk about laws and this and that. You gotta have laws. You gotta go by laws. It it would be we would be un uncivilized if we didn't have laws to go by. You know, but just gotta just have respect for 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 your fellow person. That was Richard Yodici. He was a mechanic with Con Edison in New York for decades. He spent five months helping restore power to Lower Manhattan after nine eleven. And you'll be able to read more of his story on our website later today. And see some photos. Richard is one of tens of thousands of survivors and first responders continuing to deal with health and psychological consequences from the aftermath of 9-11. Attorney Michael Barish knows these stories all too well. He's managing partner of Barish McGarry and spent the past two decades representing more than 20,000 members of the 9-11 community. And Barish estimates about 2,000 of his clients live in Florida, and he joins us now. Michael, thanks so much for the time. Uh, thanks for having me. What a moving interview by um, Richard. I was so uh, I was so impressed by how articulate he was and how tough that was for him to get through it. Yeah, no, no, it definitely was. And I'm wondering, you know, Michael, I mean, how common is, is Richard's story among the, the community you represent? Oh, my God. So these uh, the 9-11 community, and I want to make sure that every one of your listeners understands that because I represent 2000 people living in Florida, as you mentioned, um, the 9-11 community didn't just consist of first responders. There were yes, there were 100,000 cops, firefighters, construction workers, Con Ed, Verizon, all that. But there were 300,000 office workers, 50,000 teachers and students. 25,000 downtown residents, they were all exposed to the same toxic dust. And not surprisingly, they're all coming down with the same cancers and serious respiratory illnesses. Did and you? to bring it topical, they're all so vulnerable to the coronavirus. Did they understand? I mean, I'd asked Richard that. Did they understand when they were there in it, what, you know, what the long-term consequences would be? Okay, so um, this is, I, I'm, I'm not going to make a political statement at all. First of all, NPR is neutral, as am I. I represent people on both sides of the aisle, you know, Republican, Democratic, black, white. It doesn't matter. This was incredibly uh, Democratic toxic dust. But the EPA lied to the American people after 9-11 when the EPA administrator assured everybody the air is safe to breathe. They wanted to reopen Wall Street, and that's what they did the next week. And as a result, people like Richard, people like me, I'm two blocks from ground zero, we all came back to work. You know, the first responders, I mean, they do an unbelievable job, but that's their job. You know, all of the rest of us, we were just doing what our government told us. The air is safe. Go back to work. Let's show our enemies that we can't be intimidated. And that's what we did. The kids went back to all the schools. The stock market reopened. And as a result, that's why we're now seeing this explosion of cancers that's considered presumed linked to the 9-11 uh, toxic dust. I represented Detective James Ed Roger, for whom the bill is named. When they did an autopsy of his lungs, they found ground glass asbestos, benzene, lead in his lung tissue. And if he had it in his, we all have it in ours. But to answer your, your question, no, we didn't know we were subjecting ourselves to these permanent has, illnesses. Has that, by the way, because, you know, people still have to say it's that the link is presumed, right? Right. Okay. And it's presumed it's it's presumed it's non-adversarial. It's no litigation. You're entitled to free healthcare from the World Trade Center health program for the rest of your life. 
you're entitled to compensation from the victim compensation fund if you have a certified 9-11 illness, but you must register. And as long as we're on this, I implore all of your listeners, spread the word. The government is giving everyone a chance here to get that free health care. And there are clinics all over Florida, by the way, and to get compensation. But if for anybody who got cancer or a serious respiratory illness more than two years ago, you must register by July 29th of next year. And if you know anybody who died, their family has until next July to make a claim. Please don't let anyone miss this deadline. And you know what, it, because Richard mentioned how he could not act, he didn't qualify for the health program until he had contracted the prostate cancer. So is are there roadblocks that you see that people might face in trying Great to- Great question. Yeah, so th- there aren't roadblocks. And as I said, it's not adversarial, but you, ne- you need to prove that you were in the exposure zone. You can't just you know call up the, the government and say, hey, I want you to send me $250,000. You have to prove through witnesses, through employer verification, that you were in the exposure zone for a long enough period of time so that the health program will certify your illness. And by the way, prostate cancer after skin cancer is the most common in the 9-11 community because that air was so toxic. And for some reason, the the men's prostates are really suffering. Um, And so are all these people with basal cells, squamous cells. So again, another thing I ask everyone to do, if you were down there, make sure you go for an annual dermatology, full body skin checkup. Early detection really can save your life. I'm talking with Michael Barish, managing partner of Barish McGarry. He's representing more than 20,000 survivors and first responders from the 9-11 terror attacks, many of whom live here in Florida. Um, Michael, do we know how many 9-11 survivors uh, have passed away from COVID-19 who live in South Florida? Well, uh, so I'll tell you all together, I represent, as you said, over 20,000 survivors and responders. About 2,000 of my clients are now living in Florida, and I've now lost 20 of them due to COVID-19. I suspect the number is much higher, but we don't yet have uh, death certificates because the medical examiner's offices are so overwhelmed. Altogether, I've lost over 100 clients, and it shouldn't really surprise anybody that the 9-11 community is particularly vulnerable to the coronavirus, because think about it. What were the most common 9-11 illnesses? They were respiratory illnesses like COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, but also 68 cancers. And if you've had chemotherapy or radiation, your immune system is shot. So if someone in the 9-11 community is, whether they're in Florida or North Carolina, New York, wherever, and they are exposed to this virus, they don't have the immune system to fight it off. And that's why you asked a great question to Richard. What is your recommendation? Well, I'm going to I'm going to echo what he said. Please have common courtesy. You may feel that you don't need to wear a mask, but even Senator Rubio is now telling people, quote, wear the damn mask. Even our president is now telling people it's okay to wear a mask. But, you know, that's why I got so mad you know, at the government, they lied to us in 2011, in 2001 about, you know, oh, the air is safe. And what did they do 19 years later? And by the way, this is through eight years of Obama. So I'm not just blaming President Trump, but we were unprepared. We didn't have enough respiratory protection. And then the leaders of our country told us, oh, it's just a hoax. You don't have to worry about it. Well, it isn't a hoax. 190,000 people later, who are dead, they'll tell their families will tell you it's no hope. Let me let me finish with this. How's your focus? Uh, the focus of your legal work changed because of the pandemic? I mean, what are you doing to ensure this? This is a very vulnerable community right now. Oh, my God, you're so right. And what I'm doing is I'm telling first of all, we've spent a lot of time bringing masks to first responders and healthcare workers throughout the tri state area. But I'm also just trying to tell people, take care of yourself stay indoors. I know it sucks. It really does. Um, But you are so vulnerable. You are at risk. Do not go out. And if you do, 
please wear a mask. Air, ask everyone around you to wear a mask. How has my practice changed? Well, I have a lot of clients dying. Not a day goes by without one of my clients dying. It's really heartbreaking. And I so appreciate you, um, you know, following this story and helping me get the message out. Michael, I appreciate your time and, and the insight as well. And to all of those survivors that you're responding to and helping, um, you know, uh, hopefully they stay safe as they move forward. Thank you so much for everything. I appreciate it. My pleasure. You take care.